Good afternoon and welcome uh, to another of the All Party Parliamentary Group on AI's uh, regular discussion meetings. Um, it's, it's great to have you all with us and I'm sure we're going to be having a very interesting and quite topical uh, discussion this afternoon around uh, designing fair and robust AI-based assessment systems. Um, but just before we get on to the, the meat of the subject, um, if I can just remind people that wherever possible to remain muted uh, so that we don't get uh, too much of a clash in terms of uh, background noise. Um, because, of course, we really want to hear what our panellists have to say. Um, as I said, um, this is a very topical subject. Over the summer, we saw the uh, impact that uh, algorithms can have when uh, we used it in the UK to assess our A-level results. And obviously, something somewhere had gone uh, awry um, because the results that came out didn't seem to match uh, what might have been predicted. And at that point, my instant reaction was, I wonder how the algorithm works and what the data was. And of course, uh, that's been a topic of discussion uh, ever since. And so this is a timely meeting to discuss uh, how we can improve that and how uh, algorithms uh, conducting assessments, uh, compare with teacher assessments, and of course, ultimately, this is all about the impact it has on students and their potential performance, their motivation, and of course, trust in the wider technology. Um, before uh, we go to our first speaker, I just now want to go to my co-chair, uh, Tim Clement-Jones, and then I'm going to go to uh, Birgitta Anderson, who is uh, from the Big Innovation Centre, who act as our secretariat, and whom, without uh, their support, we would be able to do none of this. So, uh, Tim, first, I don't know if you want to say a few words, and then Birgitta, and then we'll come to our first panellist. Thank you very much indeed, Stephen, and welcome, everybody. And um, absolutely uh, topical, um, uh, the whole issue of algorithms in education, in assessment, um, uh, uh, and the, the danger is, of course, that um, over the summer, a sort of overly negative view has arisen um, about the place of AI and other technologies in enhancing uh, education. And um, I, I think what we need to do really is to look at this in, in, in the round, um, is to look at the opportunities as well as the risks. And as, 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 as Stephen rightly says, I mean, there are issues, um, you know, to do with uh, data, to do with uh, the, life, uh, the future of young people, effectively, um, that we need to look at. But I think what it, we need to sort the wheat from the chaff. And um, uh, Priya and I have been engaged um, for the last uh, couple of years in the ethics of AI in education through the Institute for Ethics and AI uh, in Education and uh, trying to tease out um, what the specific issues related to education are is uh, of great importance, particularly because this kind of technology has, uh, if you like, a disproportionate impact, if one isn't careful, on uh, young people and their, and their futures. But I'm sure that we'll be teasing out um, quite a lot of that um, in our discussion today, which, as I said, is extremely timely. So thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Tim. Um, Birgitta. Yeah, thank you, and also hello for me. Uh, just uh, before we started, we discussed how it's really important to do community engagement in these areas related to education and we've also had meetings on, on health, etc. And I just want to tell people that we are launching, I'm quickly sharing a screen here, we are launching a major community platform in which you can see uh, how you can actually engage and become part of this. So it's not just at the meetings here you sign in, you're actually part of it. And on the community, we can do lots of different things. And the one thing, of course, is that we can uh, uh, we can see all the meetings we have for us coming, and we can participate in discussions on the pavilion wall, and we can see literally everything from past meetings, all videos, all photos, etc. So I will uh, stop sharing my screen now, but just tell you that uh, you will in the next uh, few days receive an email in which you can all sign up and actually join as members in different forms and capacity. And that will be a, a very a different change for the APBD community that we actually could join in online 
and can engage in the Calibri in an open project uh, co-creating platforms. And we hope that that will be a great resource moving forward. And we don't only meet like this, but we can actually engage uh, after the meetings as well and become part of more like a, a set community moving forward where you've got everything in one place. Excellent. And um, thank you, Begita. And I'm sure people will uh, have a lot of uh, fun exploring that pavilion. I, I know that from our discussions, there's a huge amount of very interesting stuff on there and all the things that we've been looking at previously. Right. Uh, we will move on to uh, the, the main part of the meeting. Now, it's split into two halves. We're going to hear from our six speakers, each of whom is going to talk to us for six or seven minutes. I will keep time. Um, if I unmute... Uh, it means I'm about to tell you that you're running out of time. Um, so please uh, do your best so that we can get through all six of our speakers. And then the second half, uh, we will have some Q&A. And can I invite panellists and attendees to use the Q&A function uh, to drop their questions into there? Um, and then uh, Zero will uh, curate those for me and we will then invite uh, people to unmute and to uh, ask their question either directed generally at the panel or at a, a particular individual. Um, right, so now uh, we have a slight complication to start with, I believe. It's not really a complication, it's just uh, unusual. Our first speaker is Simon Buckingham Shum, uh, who is, I believe, a pre-record because he is Professor of Learning uh, informatics at the University of Technology in Sydney, Australia. Uh, and so I think this has been pre-recorded. So uh, going to be difficult to ask some questions, but I'm sure we will all be very interested to hear what Simon has to say. Thank you for the opportunity to contribute to the important work of this all-party parliamentary group on AI. I'm Simon Buckingham Shum, Professor of Learning Informatics at the University of Technology, Sydney, prior to which I was a professor at the Open University in the UK. Over the last decade, I've been active in shaping the emerging field of learning analytics, co-founded the Society for Learning Analytics Research, and have published extensively on the human-centered design of educational technology powered by analytics and AI, with specific attention to the skills and dispositions learners need for lifelong learning. All the points I'm about to make are backed by research sources in my written statement. There's great interest in adaptive AI tutors that coach students at their own pace until they have mastered core skills and knowledge. The full automation of teaching, assessment and feedback works for certain modes of teaching and learning and where the student's mastery of the curriculum can be modeled in detail. In STEM subjects, there's evidence that compared to conventional learning experiences, students in school and university can learn more quickly and in some cases to a higher standard using AI tutors. A different class of technology has no deep knowledge of the curriculum or the student's expertise, but can still predict if a student is going to struggle academically. Student support teams skilled in the use of predictive models are improving outcomes for struggling university students by making more timely interventions. I'll flag two challenges for the way we introduce these tools. A key factor is teacher training. When teachers are suitably trained, they use the tools well and value the insights they gain to make better use of their time. However, upskilling teachers is all too often neglected and underfunded. Secondly, while AI tutors can enable impressive gains in the efficiency of learning, core skills and facts, what do we do with the time this releases in the curriculum? Do we fill those free slots with more disciplinary knowledge and skills to master and memorize? A smarter strategy is to enrich the curriculum with activities to more fully develop the qualities that so many educationalists and employers are calling for. Curiosity, collaboration, reflection, critical thinking, ethical thinking, systems thinking, holding perspectives in tension, and the readiness to step out of your comfort zone. The frontier challenge then is to harness analytics and AI to build the knowledge, skills, and dispositions needed for lifelong learning and a workforce better prepared for change and complexity. It's more challenging for AI to help build these higher order qualities, but progress is being made. Designing valid, 
reliable assessments is an established discipline and AI should be held to the same standards. Some AI tutors are validated assessment tools, predictive of student performance in established exams. Looking to the future, however, high stakes exams may become irrelevant as a yardstick since they test students for just a few hours under artificial conditions. Learning tools powered by analytics and AI can continuously assess students as they are learning over extended periods under diverse and more authentic conditions, providing a more robust picture of their ability. In the many contexts where full automation of teaching and assessment is not possible, AI can still give formative feedback. However, reliable and fair outcomes depend on greater human agency. Both teachers and students must be equipped to question and if necessary, overrule an AI diagnosis. In fact, critiquing and teaching an AI tool is a powerful form of learning for students. Finally, we must listen to educators. We know that when we give them a real voice in shaping AI tools, this builds trust in the system. They feel respected as professionals and become champions to their peers. The skilled use of AI tutors shows teachers with much greater precision how their students are doing. They can focus attention on what is proving the most difficult material. Predictive models can help teachers become more proactive, providing more timely support to students before they drift too far off course. Students can now receive feedback that is more timely and detailed than any teacher can provide in certain respects. This pays off in large classes, and for student work that is time consuming to grade and give good feedback on. Examples would include complex capabilities such as the quality of academic writing and face-to-face -face team working. Chatbots are becoming increasingly common and some people prefer to disclose more to an AI advisor than to a human because it's perceived as less judgmental. Students from minority groups have preferred to receive support from a pedagogical agent which they feel is less biased towards them than human staff. AI also opens new possibilities for teacher professional development to improve how they interact with students. For instance, movement sensors can reflect back to teachers how they are moving around the classroom as they teach to provoke reflection. So while the teacher-student relationship will change, it remains fundamental. No AI is going to provide the warmth and support a student needs when they arrive on a Monday morning after a tough weekend in a broken home. There remains plenty for teachers and students to work on that will be invisible to the machine. We all know that we can be crushed or boosted by the way feedback is given to us. Designed and used well, AI can amplify all that we know about the provision of timely, actionable, personalized feedback that both motivates and challenges. For instance, students report a stronger sense of belonging when AI is used to expand the teacher's ability to give good personalized feedback, but to hundreds of students at a time. But in a dysfunctional teaching culture, tools powered by analytics and AI could be dangerous because of the speed and scale at which they operate. To conclude, we are at a pivotal moment there should be no sense of inevitability about the way that AI in education unfolds. It's not magic. It's conceived, funded, and built by people who, as we speak, are making design decisions about the products that our schools, universities, and businesses will soon buy. We need strategy and investment to ensure that AI shapes education in the most productive directions. This begs the fundamental question, what kind of learners does society need to tackle our most intractable challenges? We cannot meaningfully discuss the future of AI in education without discussing what kind of education we want. Um, if Simon were uh, here, I would say thank you very much indeed uh, for, I thought, a very engaging presentation on uh, some of the benefits, but also uh, some of the uh, challenges. I don't know, Tim, if you want to just make a comment. Obviously, you can't ask a question, but... Uh... No, uh, yeah, you're quite right, Stephen. I thought I was really interested when he said um, uh, that AI, uh, his sort of final words were about AI shaping education. And of course, one of the really key things about AI is we mustn't just assume that it's going to 
deliver what education the education system as it um, applies now we've got to think in more creative ways about uh, an education system uh, that is in a sense rethought um, and that's one of the big challenges but he did rather leave us with that question uh, which no doubt uh, the rest of the evening we will uh, be trying to grapple with Absolutely. Thank you. Right. Um, we move on. Um, our next speaker is Victoria Sinel, uh, who is from Teens in AI and is an AI ambassador. Uh, Victoria. I'm really grateful to have been given this opportunity um, to speak about the topic of technology and education. Um, so in my talk, I'm going to be outlining my view of education, my experience as an A-level algorithm and my opinion on AI assessments in the education system. So the education system has remained the same for pretty much a really long time. Um, students are still only learning to pass an exam. And currently, um, students are leaving with no real world skills. Um, I think it's pretty obvious well, to all of us now that the future is going to be powered and shaped by technology. So it's, it seems it should be really important that schools should be teaching more about tech. Um, I'm not suggesting that everyone needs to learn how to code because I myself, I'm not really a coder but I do understand how tech works and I understand the ethics behind AI. I'm really aware of how technology can go really wrong and the impacts it can have on us as a, as a society. Um, the negative impacts of algorithms have been really well documented and some examples include uh, racial bias within the Google um, photo grouping algorithm and Amazon has a recruiting engine which was biased against women um, but I didn't learn this at school, I learned this online and in hackathons. Um, education in the UK does not really favour people from disadvantaged backgrounds and if um, this whole A-level algorithm situation did, it, was, it highlighted this. 7% um, of the British population are privately educated and it comes at no surprise that they were the ones that benefited from this algorithm. Um, Using technology in a system that is currently so unfair um, will reinforce a societal imbalance and reinforce a system that is really dysfunctional and quite unfair. Um, unfortunately, I was a part of the class of 2020. Um, I've been quite academically bright, always quite over, an overachiever. Um, but on my A-level results day, I was really, I, I was left feeling like a complete failure. Um, I attended a state school the sixth form because um, my family just couldn't afford for me to go to a private school um, but I was okay with that because I knew I'd be okay in um, a state school. Um, unfortunately my college had an average reputation for grades, it wasn't an overachieving college, it was quite average um, but had I known how 2020 was going to turn out I would have seeked for a much higher achieving college even if that meant me having to travel quite a bit further. Um, to say I was disappointed when I opened my results in August was an understatement. In fact, to see that the A-level algorithm had lowered every single one of my grades that my teacher had gave me, just based on the college I was attending, was really demoralizing. Um, I'm now having to spend a third year in my college because um, even one of the teachers gave me grades that didn't make sense just because they didn't know me. and. I couldn't appeal it. Um, now comparing my story to one of my friends, she uh, was lucky enough to attend a private school and she is also academically smart, but she didn't um, face any issues that I did with the algorithm because she got all her A stars and she's now on a gap year um, attending Harvard next year. Um, so I feel like all this algorithm did was reinforce the structural inequalities in our society because the wealthier privileged part of the population once again rose over the average person who may not be able to afford to go to private school. Um, I know I'm not really speaking for just myself when I say I've really completely lost trust in everybody that was involved because it, it wasn't just the grades, it was like the emotional turmoil that a lot of people went through opening like such un grades that were so undeserving. Um, Ofqual stated that their model only had a 60% um, predictive 
accuracy um, across the A-level subjects, which meant 40% of us had downgrade, 40% um, of grades were downgraded, which just doesn't seem fair at all. Um, we were not we were not guinea pigs in a rushed government experiment. This was our futures, our doors to apprenticeships, universities, um, even just going into the world of work. And now it feels like we all have to take detours and find other routes. I can't even begin to explain how it feels to have studied for 30 years to be failed by an algorithm. Um, compared to other speakers here, I know I'm not really as knowledgeable on tech as I'm just starting out. Um, but the first thing, one of the first things I ever learned was how important human-centered design is um, when it comes to solving problems that are going to be impacting humans. Um, there will never really be a perfect algorithm um, to define as a robot same as a human, but um, working with people who will be affected is probably the best way to eliminate as much bias and discrimination as possible. Tech, as we all know, um, has the potential in our, to help us tremendously in our lives, but it can also do the opposite and create further imbalance, imbalances. Um, and show the already existing inequalities in our society without talking to students, teachers, um, tech specialists, ethicists, any AI based assessments will not be as fair as they should be. Thank you. Victoria, thank you very much indeed. I thought um, your account of your own personal experience was uh, you know, um, very, very insightful. I mean, the problem was that this year there was no chance for you personally to demonstrate your own and show your own talents. I mean, it's not just the algorithm. I think the fact that you said that you're even a teacher's assessment uh, downgraded you because they didn't know you. And I think that that is part of the challenge in this uh, extraordinary time. But thank you for sharing those thoughts uh, with us. And I uh, also particularly agree with your statement that um, we don't necessarily teach coding around this, it's the understanding of the technology. I mean, that's in a wider sense, not just to do with education. You know, that the ethics and how, how it can be used and how it works is equally as important as those who are able to, to write the code. So uh, thank you for sharing your thoughts. And I know that there will be one or two questions to you, uh, but the first one will come from uh, Lord Tim Clement Jones. Uh, I always nip in at this point, uh, Victoria. Um, but look, you've had a lousy experience and you speak for an awful lot of young people your age. And of course, we've got MPs like Stephen and Mark um, on, on the, uh, uh, the meeting tonight. And I'm sure that they, you know, have had some pretty harrowing um, conversations with parents and uh, young people as well um, about exactly what you're talking about. But it's quite interesting because you know, you're somebody who founded Teens in AI. Um, and uh, in a sense, you've had this horrendous experience with um, algorithms. So the question really is, you know, has this fundamentally impacted on your trust in tech? Or is it fundamentally uh, impacted on your trust uh, with humans using tech? Um, because it seems to me that there is a bit of a distinction here. Um, for me personally, it doesn't uh, make me distrust tech because there wouldn't really be tech without humans. We choose how to develop it, how, what to put into it. So for me, it's it's more of a distrust in, um, in people who probably should be spending a lot more time and research to ensure that such um, kind of failures as the A-level algorithm don't happen again because it's really all about humans and talking to people and making putting in all the right things to make sure that it doesn't go wrong. Great. Well, that's a pretty generous response, if I may say so. No doubt we will be uh, talking later. Indeed. Um, thank you, Tim. And again, thank you, Victoria. Right. Um, on to our uh, third speaker, who is Corrie Kreider, co-founder of Fox Club. Uh, Corrie. Uh, six to seven minutes, please. Thank you very much for having me. I am a lawyer and Fox Club is an independent not-for-profit organization based in the UK and founded in 2019. We're new. 
Uh, we're a team of lawyers, technology experts, and communication specialists who challenge the misuse of digital technologies uh, when they go wrong, either by government or by large tech companies. And broadly, I suppose, to stand for a future where digital technology, including AI, benefits everyone, not just the privileged few. Um, in a way, I suppose you should think of the story and the cautionary tale that I'm going to talk about as uh, what to avoid next time. And lawyers like us are in some ways the kind of antibodies of the body politic. When something has gone very seriously wrong, uh, we assist people to bring legal challenges. But of course, ideally, what it would be fantastic if Parliament could guide government towards is to see that we don't have the sickness in the first place. Um, this summer, Fox Club have been involved in a couple of successful judicial reviews to the use of automated decision systems in government. One about a system used for five years to process every visa application to the UK. Uh, that one has also been scrapped and will be redesigned from the ground up, although to considerably less public pushback. Uh, and then with an A-level student from Ealing, another large comprehensive school, uh, a guy called Curtis Parfit Ford, we were in the early stages of a judicial review to the unfair A-level algorithm uh, when the system collapsed under the weight of public objection. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the A-level algorithm, as I say, so that we can all kind of learn from the mistakes and, and do better next time. Uh, from our perspective, it was both a policy and a legal failure. First on the policy side, the education department essentially decided that the most important objective this year and a difficult year granted uh, was to limit a one-time spike in grade inflation. And that was so important over and above things like individual fairness to students like Victoria. That decision, that policy decision, led to the algorithmic fiasco that we then saw. Because, of course, the algorithm in question ignored teachers' assessed grades for students in cohorts and subjects over 15 pupils and gave complete weight uh, to teachers' assessed grades in cohorts under five. Now, Victoria described to you perfectly well the impact that that then had, but essentially it had this incidental effect of privileging students in esoteric and smaller subjects that historically only wealthier schools can offer, such as, for example, classics, uh, and penalizing some of the brightest students in large subjects or historically average or underperforming schools. Now, as a policy objective, this seems to us directly to undercut other core government policy aims, such as, for example, the leveling up agenda. It is clearly a sound policy aim, not a partisan aim, to want to promote and to assist bright students, whatever their background, to advance. And I'm afraid this automated system did precisely the opposite of that. Second, and this is where we came in, the system was very probably unlawful. The legal points Fox raised in our letter before action were never actually tested in court because the system collapsed. But had the system survived to a full judicial review, there is every chance that the algorithm would actually have been struck down. Um, I won't go through all of the letter, the kind of points raised in our pre-action letter. You can find it on our website. But one of the two core problems, as we saw it, uh, one is that the system was ultra vires. That is to say, uh, Ofqual had exceeded its statutory powers by essentially building a system that didn't provide a reliable measure of students' individual achievement. That is the core purpose that Ofqual exists to support. Uh, and then the case also ran a very real risk for the government of establishing a negative precedent under something called Article 22 of the GDPR, uh, which basically governs automated decision-making with legal or significant effects. And again, you heard Victoria speak very significantly to the significant effects that it had on her. There were, as I say, a number of other public law issues, but it seems to me that the core question for policymakers is really, if thousands upon thousands of people have their futures so damaged that they take to the streets literally to curse the algorithm, then you really risk demolishing trust in any related system that you wish to establish going forward. So what is now necessary, it seems to us, and Parliament, I hope, can play a role in this, is to institute systems that will rebuild that trust. So what should Parliament help government to do? I think the first one, very obviously, is that there needs to be much greater transparency around these systems. Uh, and that isn't, that isn't to say you know, that there wasn't a consultation process. There was, although there was significant policy movement after the consultation. But consider the likely response. Had the government just said its objectives in plain English some months ago and basically said, look, we've decided to avoid a one-time uptick in grade inflation. We're going to substitute teachers' grades with a statistical prediction that is going to limit inflation but lead to individually unfair results. How do you, the public, feel about it? Um, 
had the government been more open about what it had decided to prioritize and who it had decided to leave behind, the result might well have been better because a course correction might have been forced before it was too late. Um, more broad, oh, and the other thing I want to say about transparency is, sorry, the 2013 McPherson Review of Models in Government uh, led to a kind of cross-governmental audit of mission-critical models that were used to kind of support government decision-making processes in general. Now, that had, that had in its mind things like uh, saving taxpayers money, value for money, other kinds of budgetary processes, but that was nearly seven years ago. It seems to us that it would be appropriate to rerun such an audit now with a public facing report uh, for algorithmic decision support systems to avoid uh, the next A-level fiasco that is coming down the pipeline. Um, we also, second, I think no more permissionless systems really should be put in place when it comes to making or influencing very significant effects on people. Uh, we perceive at the moment at Fox Club a sort of iceberg of permissionless systems used to support decisions. All of our legal challenges have succeeded at the pre-action stage, uh, which success suggests that there's been way too little thought given to the legal and policy consequences of these systems. So I would encourage this committee not to think simply how to make AI work, but uh, are there systems where AI uh, decision support may not be democratically acceptable or appropriate at all? Does the probabilistic pattern-based nature of these systems cut against the grain of people's basic sense of fairness? Um, thank you very much. Corey, thank you very much uh, indeed. Um, awful lot of uh, very interesting uh, stuff in there. I was particularly interested around the, the, the policy failure and how that policy failure might have been potentially avoided, um, as you say, by asking the public their view of what, uh, identifying the policy, avoid the one-time spike, what do you think of it, I think is... Uh, a, a very salient point and one which we have tried not necessarily specifically to that but this engagement with the public more is something we have to do um, and we, uh, the progress is quite slow um tim i'm sure you have a, a comment well it leads on very neatly from what you've said stephen because corrie you've been up against the home office in all its glory uh and the Department for Education. I mean, is there any sign? And in a sense, I, I, if, if I paraphrase you, you've almost been saying, look, I'm not sure in any circumstances this would have been legal without a really thoughtful policy underpinning. But is there any uh, sign that government departments are taking on board um, uh, what you're doing in this field? Or are you just a bunch of pesky lawyers um, that are uh, just disturbing their equilibrium? I hope not. Um, I, you know, I've been really distressed and disappointed by some of the comments some coming from some quarters about so-called lefty lawyers, because as I say, actually, I think we play a part in helping avoid uh, some of the worst mistakes of government. We, have, we are actually uh, in the early stages of trying to reach out to the Home Office about their redesign, for example, of the visa system. Uh, and we are always open to dialogue with government about how to avoid, for example, equalities concerns. Uh, when they design these systems. But as I say, I would like to emphasize this, this question of the democratic deficit, uh, because it is not simply about the how, it is also about the whether, and whether the work has been done to carry the public with you uh, before such systems are built or bought. And I really do, the other thing, last thing, sorry, there, there have been a couple of interesting municipal examples recently in Helsinki and Amsterdam, where they are starting to create public registers of AI systems. And again, I would urge Parliament to look at those and consider what could be transposed over in the governmental sphere to the United Kingdom. Yes, I've seen those. That's very interesting. Thank you, Tim. And again, uh, thank you, Corey. Right. Um, we will move on to our fifth speaker, which is... Uh, Priya Lakhani. Uh, Priya, are you there? Hi, yes. Hi. Yeah, great. Right, um, if I could ask you for sort of six or seven minutes on your take on all of this. Sure, thank you very much. Um, so I think the most important point is we have to just ask ourselves a fundamental question first. What is assessment for? So we need to ask this first before going on to whether it should be online or AI or anything else. What's assessment for and what do we count as success? because often we talk about digitization and then people look at a current system that's manually implemented and then they just take it online. Whereas what digitization is actually about is transformation. So what do we want to transform in the current education system, both from formal education perspective, all the way to sort of 
further education and higher education, because simply changing assessment to an online AI enabled system may not suffice. So if we look at the APPG report on learning how to learn, it was a few years ago. And if you turn to that report that's downloadable for everybody who's watching today, you will see a few pages on there was a list of what were hard skills and soft skills. Now, how many of these are assessed by the current education system? That report is clear. It was sponsored by various people or people had input into it, let's say. But the point is that graduate employers, some of the largest graduate employers in the United Kingdom, had input into that report. And what they're not saying is that they just want maths, English and science to be tested. They wanted all of these other skills. So the current system simply measures very narrow metrics. This comes from PISA, right? Secretaries of State care about the PISA ranking. Every Minister of Education wants to go to the next one at Davos and say, we did really well, we went up a few rankings. But actually, that pressure of theirs is then passed on to our head teachers at schools, right? And so any high stakes assessment falls foul of Good Health's Law. Good Health's Law basically says, if any measure becomes a target, it ceases to become a good measure. And so we have to be aware of that when we think about assessment and particularly high stakes assessment. So that brings us on to how can we now leverage technology to provide a more holistic view of a student's education rather than simply focus on those few grades. And obviously the debate, we haven't got time for it today, but that extends then onto why we have an EBAC, for example, and why we prioritize certain subjects in the curriculum. So how can we leverage technology. Now, should we also, we've got to answer the question of, should we also be endorsing a standardised system that effectively guarantees that a third of our students will fail? In terms of technology, you can look at things like the GMAT. So the GMAT is an adaptive assessment system they use in business schools in the USA. That's weighted more towards your ability, in a sense, than accuracy, right? It's an adaptive testing system. It's not very sophisticated. And you could look at a testing system like that that's online and available that will help to determine a student's ability rather than just, you know, can they get their multiple choice questions right or wrong and can it be a static test? But as the first speaker said, we already have systems in schools and in higher education across the globe that incorporate a learning platform with assessments. The idea is you're combining learning and assessment. Learning is the first priority. Assessment is exactly what it should be. It's there to provide feedback and then help with interventions. So this is basically a shift from summative assessment and high stakes exams towards formative assessment, the idea of those quick tests we're all used to doing after a period of short learning. And once you've got formative assessment, if you're using an online system to track data and track how a student's doing continuously, you're then starting to be able to form a picture about how they're learning. And you're using that formative assessment in a really positive way because you're able to use the feedback. A student can go back throughout the year and improve their grades, right? They could have been sick for a period of time could have been off in isolation. But the point is they're not dependent on a few day, days of high stakes assessment when you're just landed with a bunch of numbers as your grades. You have that ability to go back and improve. And surely that's, that's the idea of education is this idea of promoting agency and learning and going back and improving oneself. Obviously, what we have to talk about here is and, you know, it's not really up to us, but the curriculum still has to be reviewed because if the curriculum and then what you're assessing formatively is still really able to be gamed by rote learning, then you've got to question what you're assessing. But an online system that uses AI that tracks behaviours can actually learn a lot more about a student, for example, their effort levels, their focus levels, how often they go back. And so we can start to tick off some of those skills in terms of, you know, what's uh, noted down in the APPG report of learning how to learn, but also looking at metacognition. Now, the input and the feedback can be in this holistic picture can be from the AI assessment system. But I agree with the first speaker that it's not mutually exclusive that you can have that or teacher feedback. Teachers would be able to add into a system like this with qualitative feedback. And it's really important to be able to allow to do this. You have qualitative plus quantitative. That doesn't only improve the reliability of reducing the bias of results, but it also ensures that you've got teacher buy into the system. So combined, that's a really powerful solution. An advantage of a system like that is it increases agency and learning. So when students become used to using these sorts of systems, it provides them, you know, and that they become adults. When they need to be reskilled or upskilled, you don't have to have national retraining schemes provided by their governments. They're used to going online, they're used to upskilling themselves and finding the resources and then continuing that way. So that could have a huge dramatic impact for the future. So what else can we use for AI for in assessment? 
I think it's worthwhile that all viewers go onto the rethinkingassessment.com website. It's new. It was created by a cross-sector group of academics and educators and some people in business. They have a blog on the website, which is called When One Exam Grade in Every Four is Wrong, right? So when we look at exams and high stakes assessment, we should also think about is every exam grade given to every Victoria out there even correct, even if she was able to take the exam? If two moderators and examiners go on to one exam and they differ in the grade boundaries, it's really interesting. And you can read the blog post on actually what grade does that student end up with? Some students end up with far lower grades that actually the initial assess assessor would have given them. So we can use AI within and data science, doesn't have to be AI, within high stakes assessment if we were to continue down that route to spot discrepancies earlier and to look at predictions in what are the potential variances that we're going to be able to see in this year's exams. So we could use AI itself to create a constantly improving assessment system. So as the data grows, the learnings grow, the data science becomes more accurate and you end up with better exams. The last points I wanna make are that there are serious challenges. Now, Peter Stewart's comment I read because I'm lucky to be the fourth speaker and some others are talking about that we shouldn't conflate the two issues of the, uh, the algorithm, the exam debacle, but actually it's worth reflecting on that so we can avoid the challenges in the future. Victoria's experience is heartbreaking. There's not gonna be one person who's listened to her who's just thinking, my goodness, we're so sorry for what happened to her and her friends and, you know, and all of her peer group who struggled in the same way. People are right to point out that that algorithm was not a use of AI. And any expert in AI gets rather cross when they hear the word algorithm in exams and AI in the same sentence. It was more of a multi-step, ill-thought-out formula, something that you could create in an Excel spreadsheet. It failed to adhere to basic, basic ethical principles. It was created by humans. There was no machine acting autonomously. And it lacked being fair and explainable to those that it impacted until the transparency of that algorithm was demanded. It used data which was biased. And in case anyone wants to challenge me on whether the, on the use of the word bias, because there's been some debate about that. If no <clears throat> one from a school has achieved the highest grade in a subject in the previous three years, it was nearly impossible for anyone from that school to be awarded that grade this year. That was the point. So it vi violates the principle of merit, which underlines our educational philosophy. The very last point I want to talk about and just mention is that AI and assessment, there's so much potential. But we also have to look at the fact that one in 10 families in the UK don't have a laptop, a desktop or a tablet. And so when we're relying on technology more for assessment or learning, you could end up disproportionately harming those who are economically disadvantaged unless you sort out infrastructure and devices. Given that we're in 2020, we're talking about 5G, we're implementing 5G and Uruguay managed to get fibre in all of its schools eight years ago. I think we better get a move on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. That was um, fantastic. I mean, I think there's two points I would pull out. Firstly, could you just um, restate where that blog can be found that says one Absolutely. in four? Absolutely. So it's a, a blog on a new website uh, created by, I, I, I'm not going to do them justice by naming everybody, but uh, Bill Lucas, he's an academic and a uh, uh, Johnny Notes from Eton, there's, there's a group of them. It's called rethinkingassessment.com. So very simple, rethinkingassessment.com. There's a very smart of blogs. What they're trying to do there is think about, it's exactly the sense of the question that you're asking, rethinking assessment. And it's a group that, you know, it's for, it's an interesting group. They've got educators in the group. They have academics. They've got some people from business. And so I think, you know, what they're looking to do is challenge the entire system now. I think we're, we're at a time where we've been through such a devastating time. We can, we're, we're still going through a devastating time. There's a lot of change happening in the world. And so, you know, what we ought to be doing now is looking at the system, the education system, which really hasn't changed since the industrial revolution, the way in which we, you know, deliver teaching and learning and thinking, look, we're going through this change at the moment. Now is the time there is momentum to actually create a bigger change that is better for our children's future. If we don't do this, and this is just my theory, but if we don't do this, when things settle down, and I really hope they settle down soon, we're not, there's not going to be much appetite for more bold change. You know, people will want to just settle down and get on with things. So momentum is now. So anyone who's got ideas, even if they challenge our ideas, my ideas, talk about them now, raise them now, and let's create a much better education system for our children's future. Thank you. And I'm, <clears throat> I completely agree. And I'm sure there will be some questions around that. But a very quick one from Tim at this point. Yes, because uh, Priya's actually answered 
the question that I was going to ask, uh, which is, you know, given from your perspective, Priya, as a member of the Council for AI and so on, you can see what is possible, but there's a huge gap. Um, uh, there's a whole lot not being done, but you're really laying it at the path of the, uh, the education system. But I'm going to come quickly back just to make a, one observation, which is I think you and Corey are going to agree on bias. I'm not quite sure you're going to agree that there was a human in the loop on that algorithm, uh, because I suspect that part of the case being made by Fox Club was that actually it wasn't compliant with GDPR. But um, I, I'd be interested in a in a in a bit of perspective later on, but I'm not going to prolong uh, those proceedings because we've got to get on with our next speaker, as I know Stephen is intimating. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. <laughs> Very good. Right, let's um, move on to our final speaker, who is up very early, I believe, and that's Lawrence uh, Moroni. Uh, Lawrence, um, hey. you are an AI advocate at Google, and I think you are joining us early in the morning from Seattle, if that's correct. Y yes, I am. Not that early. It's 10 a.m. now, so it's, oh, uh, okay. I've enjoyed my breakfast. And so good morning from sunny Seattle. Uh, I'm actually going to share a slide deck, so just give me a moment and let me know if you can see it. I'll just go through the slides like this. So one of the things that you know I've heard earlier on, and first of all, really thanks to Priya for pointing out that the debacle with the A-level results was not an AI thing, that it was a statistical thing, and it was obviously a lot more than just a statistical thing. And one of the things that I'm really working hard on is that AI actually has a bad reputation because of the uh, what we call the, the Gartner hype cycle. And if you look at the Gartner hype cycle right now, you know it looks something like this, and there's a peak of inflated expectations. And I draw this orange arrow to say, this is where AI really is on the hype cycle. There isn't enough expertise and there isn't enough knowledge in AI right now. And as a result, there's a whole lot of misunderstanding around it. I love something Lord Clement Jones said earlier on where I'll quote, he said, there's a danger because of an overly negative view of AI in education and we need to think in more creative ways. So part of our vision and part of what we're working on is to say, how do we create more AI experts? Uh, a survey in China a couple of years ago said that there are 300,000 AI practitioners globally and compare that with about 40 million software developers globally. So the goal is if we can really teach people and if we can convert, say, 10 percent of the software developers in the world to be true experts in AI, we'll move through the hype cycle into what's called the trough of disillusionment and then out of there productivity can come. Productivity then becomes really important in public sector stuff because AI skills right now are incredibly expensive. And when AI skills are incredibly expensive, it's very easy to cut corners. And when we cut corners, people can be hurt. And so that's one of the things that our goal is to vastly improve and vastly increase the number of trained AI practitioners globally. So there's some strategies that we have around that that I'm going to be sharing. But I also want to talk a little bit about the economic impact. We've probably all seen charts like this one. And this is the UK GDP since 1986. Now, it generally has an upward trend, so that hides maybe some of the trends that caused great things for the economy. So I created this derivative of it where I'm looking at the GDP as a proportion of the previous two years GDP. And as a result, you'll see there's a couple of areas here of the, it's really good if the line is above 1.0 because that shows it's sustained growth within the economy. And there's a couple of areas like this one, which really started in the early 90s and lasted until the mid 2000s. And that was really the tech revolution. So as we brought more and more people online who were skilled in tech and huge companies, the biggest like uh, market cap companies in the world, the Apples, the Googles, the Microsofts, the Amazons of the world were all created in this period. And as a result, it was a time of great economic growth. Here's the UK's growth. Of course, it was global growth, too. And then this uh, peak is uh, the app economy. Uh, a survey recently showed that there are between six and seven million app economy uh, jobs in the US out of a workforce of about 120 million. So it's around 5% of the workforce. And despite the big cliff that we see on the right hand side, how the economy was impacted by COVID, the Apple app economy alone in the US added 300,000 jobs. So we see there's also a potential huge economic boom of AI. But the idea is if we can normalize AI, if we can get more people who are experts in AI, some of the problems, some of the perceptive problems of AI can go away, but there can also be a huge economic boom. And it's my personal theory that the economic boom that comes as a result of AI will be bigger than either of these two. So our vision is really train millions of developers to reach billions of people, to make people's lives better with it. 
the strategies that we've been taking with this is the first one is really professional training. So we've been putting uh, massively online open courses out there uh, through companies like Coursera and Udacity or local courses for particular countries like NetEase in China uh, with the vision of like, let's make AI easy for people who know a little bit of code. We've also been doing direct at scale where we work with governments in particular countries to, um, you know, either in the public sector or the private sector to kind of drive uh, AI folks within those particular countries. And a couple of examples of this would be in Indonesia, for example, there was an academy called Bankit, and they uh, put together a cohort of 300 people to become AI experts to seed the next generation of startups in Indonesia. And now next year, they're rerunning the same thing. They're multiplying it by 10 to 3,000. And the government of Indonesia is getting involved to work with universities to help universities be funded to train people like this. And then the other one at the bottom, and it's one that's just starting this week, is there's a machine learning boot camp in Korea, where the idea is that people who go to this boot camp or are selected for this boot camp will get guaranteed jobs at these startups, and these startups are funding that. And the cohort there is in the hundreds. So, of course, as well as professional training, we also want to work with academia. And when I've worked with universities, and I've worked with several universities in the UK, the biggest problem in computer science in universities is always being able to train people in the new and relevant skills. Uh, I graduated from a university in the UK in 1991, and I knew Pascal and Prolog when the market me wanted me to know Visual Basic and C++. And it was very difficult for me. I was unemployed for a long time. And so one of the things that we're trying to do is fix that problem with universities and course development and helping fund um, them to have TAs, giving them syllabus material, giving them access to some of the resources Courses that they need to be able to teach so that they can try out new courses. And the one biggest problem I've heard from universities is that in order for them to teach a new technology and a new class and a new technology, they have to retire an old one. And often the friction behind that is just way too difficult. So our goal is to give support for them around that. And some of the universities that we worked with in the UK, uh, Cardiff University um, launched a master's in AI and they launched a number of data science programs. And I was just speaking with the professor there uh, yesterday, uh, sorry, uh, last week, and they mentioned that like their enrollment is increasing drastically despite COVID and particularly overseas enrollment is increasing drastically. We've also recently funded University College Oxford to start looking into creating some undergraduate classes uh, in AI. And one of the shining jewels for us has been Imperial College in London where uh, Professor Webster there, he has created a number of online courses in data science and AI and even then created a course on Coursera. So a massively open online course to again, try to bring AI to as many people as possible. But our goal, like I've said, is that one of the things that one of the perception problems behind AI is that it's very, very difficult to do. It's very difficult to become an expert in it. So we're striving to show people that it's really not that difficult. And if we can, you know, take 30 of the 30 million software developers, if we can take 10% of them and train them by 2022, we'll increase the number of AI practitioners globally by 10x. And that's been our striving goal. Ooh, getting echoes. <laughs> that's been our striving goal. And uh, that's one of the things we're working towards. So thank you so much. Lawrence, thank you uh, very much indeed. Um, again, I'm, I'm taking some of those graphs and uh, perhaps the, we can share some of that at some point. Uh, but one of the things I, that struck me was that if we need to increase the, the pool of practitioners, uh, the number of real AI experts? Do we not also need to broaden uh, the, the pool from which they are drawn? And how might we go about that? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think, um, first of all, there is already a sufficiently large pool of people who can become AI experts, um, people who know coding, people who know software. Like I said, a conservative estimate globally, there's 30 million. The reality is it's probably closer to 60 million. So that's the first wave, I would say, is the people who already have some kind of software expertise we can draw from. Then being able to retrain people who do not yet have expertise um, is surprisingly not difficult. I have a very close friend and she's an NHS doctor and um, she has become disillusioned with working with the NHS and she has actually retrained herself as an AI practitioner. So it's like, obviously she's a super intelligent woman to be an NHS doctor to begin with, um, but the, 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 the potential is there in anybody if you design a curriculum that's sufficient for anybody to be able to learn to see how they can succeed with it. One of the biggest mistakes we've personally seen with AI education, and when I say that, I mean education of AI, is that it generally very much aimed at uh, PhDs. It's aimed at people who intimately know calculus and all those kind of things, and it doesn't have to be. And that's one of the things that we're trying to change. 
Excellent. Uh, thank you. Tim, I don't know if you've got a brief question before I come to our final speaker, which is... Yeah, just, just a quickie. Um, I, I was just going to um, observe that maybe the, the problem was that we had got to the trough of disillusionment before we've got to the peak of inflated expectations in the Gartner hype cycle, Lawrence, but uh, who knows? Um, but you partly answered the question, but there is on the, on the, in terms of getting more practitioners, I mean, are there cultural issues because you're a global company, but how, how do you adjust to different education systems and so on? I mean, there is an issue of ad adaptation as well as, creation surely yeah uh, great question so on, on the hype cycle part the peak of inflated expectations can also be negative expectations um, not just positive ones so that's what i'm referring to that way when it comes to adapting to different education systems that's an excellent question and thankfully we're a global company so we have experts in almost all of our territories on the education systems within those territories but we have noticed that there is a kind of a unifying force when it comes to learning how to be an ai practitioner that people are really interested number one is we've mentioned a lot of um, ethics and bias, that there's a huge interest in that, but there's a lack of sufficient tooling around that. And we're hoping to grow that ecosystem with sufficient tooling for people to be able to spot um, ethical and bias issues within data and that kind of thing. And then the second one is that um, while not everybody is cut out to be a coder, um, we find that code, if you can at least know a little bit of it, is tends to be a unifying platform. There's a language called Python which was designed to be super easy to learn and super easy to use. And that's what we use as our primary teaching tool. Um, I've worked with like children as young as six or seven in China um, who've already become Python experts and they're looking to learn how to build machine learning models and things like that. So, you know, not, it's not for everybody, but we believe that it can be a lot broader than perception would suggest. Great. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much. And as I thank say, you. Our final speaker is Professor Janice, I'm not sure if it's Gobert or Gobert. Janice, perhaps you'll enlighten me and uh, please have uh, six to seven minutes. Thank you, Janice Gobert. Thank you so much. Yes. Um, good evening. Um, I have a PhD from the University of Toronto and a master's from McGill University, both in cognitive science. I'm a professor at Rutgers Graduate School of Education in New Jersey. I'm also the co-founder and CEO of a company called Apprentice, which is an ed tech company. And my work sits at the intersection of learning sciences and computer science and focuses on AI-based assessment and intelligent tutoring in the domain of science. Um, so here I'm gonna address performance assessment of science competencies for which 21st century skills are needed for STEM careers. And these are reflected in international policy statements such as the UNESCO 2030 report. I wanna illustrate my comments using a system called Inkits, Inquiry Intelligent Tutoring System for Students and Ink Blotter, a teacher dashboard that accompanies Inkits. Both were developed by my team. So in these systems, students are not assessed via coarse grain multiple choice uh, items, rather students do virtual science experiments. They form a hypothesis about a phenomenon, collect data with simulations to address their hypothesis, interpret their data, warrant their claims with data and communicate findings in words. Because students use science simulations to do science, the tasks are authentic and provide ecological validity that reflect the methods and skills used by real scientists. As students engage in virtual inquiry, rich, high fidelity log files and open responses are generated and logged. Theory from learning sciences is used to distill and aggregate these log data and to design the categories auto uh, auto scored by algorithms to assess students' competencies. Data mined algorithms can handle what we call the four Vs in students' log data, namely the large volume of log data produced, the velo velocity at which it is generated, the veracity in the fine grained log files, and the variability in students' logs, since there are many ways in which inquiry can be done, both productively and unproductively. Similarly, highly precise natural language processing algorithms can auto score students' explanations of science that are better than hand scoring, which is time intensive and subject to both fatigue and bias. AI based assessment uh, uh, systems that blend learning and assessment formatively can change both learning and teaching. First, algorithms can assess students in real time. 
They drive scaffolds to students while they learn when the system detects that the students need help. These are effective at remediating students' learning difficulties. For example, our digital agent supports robust transfer of skills to new science topics, and we've tested this up to 170 days later. The AI-based alerts enable teachers to better monitor large classes and identify specific types of difficulties for each student in the form of succinct and actionable information about how to help students. With these alerts, teachers can guide whole class instruction, do differentiated instruction, or do one-to-one -one tutoring, all in class or in remote settings via Google Hangouts. So for example, when the schools closed in, in spring 2020 due to COVID, teachers from 80 countries signed up to use Inkits and Inkblotter, and this includes 27 schools in the UK, by the way. Um, so this technology can be transformative. Our research has shown that what teachers say to students in responding to an alert can predict students' performance on the next inquiry task for the skill on which they were helped. These systems can deliver reliable and fair results because the activities are guided by evidence-centered design and the literature on inqu inquiry learning. The activities and subcomponents underlying inquiry are iteratively refined via user testing with students and teachers. The data mind algorithms um, are built on students are, I'm sorry, the data mind algorithms are built and validated using log data collected with diverse students and generalizability is tested with new students who were not used to build the algorithms. Lastly, when the algorithm is unsure of a student's competency at a particular skill, the teacher can be alerted or soft scaffolds can be used in the system. These technologies affect students' motivation because they give support when students need it. They don't flounder too long, which can be frustrating and lead to disengagement. And students' skill development is not undermined by help abuse, which is used in students that, uh, systems that provide on-demand help. When a digital agent supports a student, his or her peers are also not aware who's getting help. So that supports deep learning as well. So in conclusion, system, systems that are theoretically based and empirically tested should be used for performance assessment rather than coarse grained summative tests that do not reflect students' competencies important to 21st century skills and careers. So using data both from how they do science and how they write about science is important and it's important to use these in tandem because if you rely only on students writing, you can get false negatives. So those who can do science but can't describe what they know in words, and this is particularly um, a problem in STEM domains, or you can get false positives, those who are simply parroting what they've read or heard, but cannot successfully do experiments. So for example, our research that has shown that between 30 to 60% of students are misassessed if um, teachers rely on students writing. So I'll stop there for questions. Janice, thank you very much uh, indeed. Um, some very interesting, so I, I get the sense that you see that teacher and algorithm working together as a, an augmented uh, system rather than one replacing the other. Um, but Tim, I'm sure you've got a comment. Yes, I, very interesting, Janice. Um, and uh, you are using some quite controversial technology though, such as eye tracking and so on. How transparent is the use of the technology that you're using, whether to the student or their parents, if they're minors, or um, uh, the use of the data and the sharing of the data that's generated. Right. So first of all, there's no eye tracking um, present in ink kits right now. There, there used to have a, we used to have an eye tracking component. We're not actually using that right now. Um, because I'm at a university, uh, universities have very robust um, human subjects review protocols about confidentiality, about what data are collected. The parents, of course, have to consent. The students themselves have to consent. Uh, th that's in the form of a letter of assent. Um, the teachers also do a very rigorous review of, of what data is being collected and how it's being stored and fully anonymized, et cetera. So um, I do believe that uh, the universities that are involved in this kind of work have, have their handle around the human subjects issues that are involved in terms of confidentiality. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you very much again, indeed, Janice. Right. Now we've got about 
20 minutes or so for questions. So sadly, we're not going to be able to get to uh, everyone. But the first question is from Rob Aitchison. Rob, are you there? Do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, I just wondered. I mean, our education system is is actually quite old. <laughs> it was designed to um, in Victorian days. And I'm kind of wondering, can AI guide as a careers advisor? Because it's quite hard nowadays to uh, for careers advisors to advise on some of the things that are being discussed. You know, can it be used to assist um, directed learning for the individual skill sets? And I just wondered in the academics, has it been studied uh, looked at and over what sort of year groups um, has it been studied in? Thank you, Rob. Um, anyone want to try and answer that or at least comment on it? Janice? I'm partic- yeah. Oh, go on. Go ahead. I'm just, yeah, I'm particularly thinking in Google's comments. So um, in the past, I know a lot of linguists that have transferred to um, coding, but if you look at them when they originally studied, it was never suggested to them as a career choice. Yeah, uh, I, I can take that one. As you mentioned, the Google comment, I think it would be really nice if um, coding could be part of a syllabus at many universities, like maybe at least an initial part of the syllabus so that people could kick the tires to see if they like it. Um, I, I use like one university in this country as an example is Stanford University and every uh, student who goes to Stanford, regardless of what they study, have to do a course called CS106A, which is a basic coding course. And it's actually a really excellent one that teaches them the skills. And I've known people who, having done that, ended up switching majors because they you know, fell in love with coding. They fell in love with being able to create stuff. So if you know schools could do some kind of a basic syllabus like that, um, not too difficult that it turns people off, but good enough so that people can be productive and that they can learn um, if this is something that they really want to use to enhance their skill set, like the NHS doctor I mentioned earlier on, um, I think it would be a really powerful thing. Can I um, make a, a comment on AI as a career counsellor? Thank you. I just think, um, I think it's, it, it, there's so many applications here but we have to be really careful so I'd love to see uh, an autonomous system that could recommend to an individual um, potential potential career opportunities for them but it would be a system that would be designed in sort of an upside down way where it would also potentially recommend things that it wouldn't normally seek as recommendations the reason why I'm saying this is that if for example we mined LinkedIn and we thought right we're going to mine LinkedIn and we're going to look at you know, it's a big data set, who's been successful in what, in terms of, you know, educational career, and then who's been successful in what careers, you end up with potentially a huge bias. I mean, I remember when I was a kid, I was told you'll never be a barrister, because you're female from an ethnic minority, and you're not going to Oxbridge. And so what we wouldn't want is an AI trained on that sort of data. I did become a barrister and a successful one, but the idea was, you know, then would it never suggest to a female from an ethnic minority, not from Oxbridge, that they could ever go down that career route? So I think there's so many exciting applications, but to avoid bias and discrimination, the AI would have to be built incredibly carefully. Um, And so there's lots of opportunity. I love Lawrence's presentation because it's the fundamental point of we've got to educate the education sector. We've actually got to, you know, it's a, it, it's a much bigger point. Um, but I think we'd have to be very, very careful with that particular application for the reason I explained. There's an old joke in the software circles that nothing works until version three. And uh, the failures of version one and two of that system could be really devastating. Uh, so it's one of the areas where we'd have to be really, really careful in doing something like that. It would have to be done like an experimental way before it would be rolled out um, and people to like trust their livelihoods on it. Thank you for that. Right. And um, second question is from Tim Pickering. Tim. Oh, yes. Thank you for the opportunity to ask a question. So um, it's Tom Pickering, actually. Um, but uh, the... Uh, I think there's a challenge here with, with focusing on the um, the branches of the tree rather than the basics of the tree itself. Um, as a business person, I look at the application first and um, look at you know um, whether or not, for example, in the assessment situation, whether or not a teacher-led solution was fundamentally a better solution and the right approach, and whether or not the the expectation that tech was the right solution or would, would deliver a realistic outcome was frankly naive. So I think there's a more fundamental, you know, basic question around really understanding the nature of the tree rather than sort of tinkering with the branches. Thank you for that. And apologies for calling you Tim. Tom, um, 
You're, you're so, Tim. uh, Tim's on the other one, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the best That's people. Cool. Emily Tom, right. Go ahead and clear that up. Who would, uh, yes, Janice, thank you. Uh, hi, Tom. Thanks for your question. That's a really good question. Um, I think, um, you know, there is some perception that uh, technology might replace teachers. And I can say wholeheartedly in the case of our system and most systems that I know by the way are thoughtfully created, um, the teacher's uh, role is emphasized. So the teacher now has this data that he or she can use to help students one-on-one -on -one do small group differentiated instruction or do whole class instruction. And this is really powerful to them because otherwise they're walking around a computer lab, kids are doing virtual inquiry and they're hanging over their shoulder trying to figure out the myriad of ways the student conducted inquiry incorrectly perhaps several steps back. So now the teacher can go over and actually use the data to make a decision. So we find that, and we've interviewed, by the way, hundreds of teachers, perhaps about 600 teachers, and we're in use in 86 countries now. Um, teachers absolutely love having this level of data because they it informs their instruction and it puts the focus back on what they love to do and why they became teachers, which is they wanted to teach. They didn't want to sit there assessing what students were doing and, and grading papers and, and, you know, writing tests and developing tests. And so technology that can be used that blends learning and assessment really helps. And frankly, during COVID, it's really saved a lot of uh, teachers back and backs and, and students as well. For example, in, in, um, in the case of our, our system, which got used um, extensively during COVID, um, students saw incredible gains in learning, sometimes better than they had in, in a real classroom, including students who are quite disenfranchised for learning from learning, including ELLs, English language learners. And I think that sometimes when they're separated from their peers, maybe they're a little bit more serious about school. So we're digging down on that analysis because we have um, several schools in which the students did far better at home working one-on-one -on -one with the digital agent than they did in the classroom. Thank you, Janice. That was very helpful. Uh, I'll go to our third question, uh, which is from Sandra Leighton Gray. Uh, Sandra, are you there? And I'm Hello. Able. Yeah, I, Hello. I was really interested in um, hearing what Victoria had to say, and so so sympathetic. Um, I work a lot in the area of assessment, and we know, as others have said, that pen and paper tests aren't very accurate. Um, it, this is compounded by really high costs of resits and remarks. And this is really prohibitive for pe many families who have children in the state sector in particular. Um, and I've got two sort of questions really. Does Victoria think that we should nationalize the UK school system? And secondly, uh, should people have free second chances? Um about nationalizing schools I think yeah um, I think it's really important that every single person no matter what background you're from gets fair and equal opportunities I'm not really a fan of the idea that um, just because you're born into a more privileged family that you get better resources and just better opportunities in general so I think the nicest idea would be to nationalize all schools obviously it's not really going to happen but that would be um, like a great kind of world to live in um i'm so sorry i've forgotten your second question so i'm asking about resits and remarks because obviously that's a really big problem for families if they suddenly have to find 50 or 100 pounds per exam if we if we if we're going to accept that perhaps only 75 percent of marks on pen and paper tests are right at the best of times and it was a it was less than that with the the um when we call it an algorithm in the summer I mean it's questionable whether it was an algorithm um should should resets be free should remarks be free yeah I think a second if, if the person wanted to do a second reset then it should be free because um my teacher who actually didn't give me a great grade just because they were new and they didn't they hadn't really taught me for that long when I I couldn't appeal it so when I went to speak to them they just told me why don't you go and resit it privately? And it took um, quite a few emails for me to get myself back into college to retake the year. So now I'm just studying for free. But had I not been able to do that, I would have had to pay um, just to resit an exam that I hadn't even taken in the first place. So yeah, I do think it's really important for 
races to be free for the second time. Thank you. Uh, thank you both for that. Um, right, our next question is from uh, Peter Scott. The assessment system seems in perception, if not actuality, designed to say you child over here are good enough to get what you want and you other child over here are not. And that the discussion about the A-level algorithm is about finding another way of delivering the same messages. But they're predicated upon a century old model of being able to gather and analyze only a few bits of data per student. As W. Edwards Deming said, stop fighting over who gets the biggest slice of the pie, figure out how to make the pie bigger. Now that we can handle much greater volumes of data and we can scale tech teaching with technology, can we use AI to create a better way to get every child a more personalized education that best serves their goals and those of the country? Perhaps Victoria would have a perspective on how she might feel better served in that respect. Uh, thank you, Peter. I don't know if you've got a quick comment, uh, Victoria, and then I don't know if anyone else wants to uh, comment on that. Uh, my laptop just lagged. Would you be able to repeat that last bit of the question, please? Can AI construct come up with a way that could construct an education that's designed specifically for your needs uh, as opposed to uh, you simply being ranked um, uh, according to to everyone else in the country. Uh, what would that, that look like if it weren't based on a competition? Um, yeah, I think the, the AA level algorithm was a, statist a statistical algorithm. So I, there wasn't really much um, kind of human thinking behind it, um, like the, in the way an AI would. So I think that would be much more, I think an AI assessment would be better than just a, a statistical algorithm. And potentially tailored learning specifically to you as an individual to assess and develop your skills and talents in the areas where they are can be maximized, I think is um, also what Peter was saying. But thank you for that, Victoria. I don't know if anyone else- Just, from a, lawyer, just from a lawyer's perspective, when we're talking about justice and assessment, uh, it seems to me that it's all very well to say, let's increase the size of the pie and let's do different ways of assessing people. But the reality of the, the, of the society in which we currently live is that the advantages are very significantly distributed according to people's access to elite educational systems. And uh, only a certain number of people are going to go to Oxford or Cambridge or some other kind of elite school. And so assessment is always going to be politically contentious. The key is to, design, to, is to seek to design a system that is fair and defensible and democratically accepted for people. Thank you for that point. Stephen, can I just ask Corrie whether she thinks there is a sort of almost like a human in the loop ingredient that solves some of the issues that we're talking about? I don't wish to be glib, but no. It seems to me that the human in the loop is the beginning rather than the end of that discussion. It is, a, it is an absolutely standard rejoinder in our early stage discussions with government departments to say, listen, this isn't, you know, this isn't, so the visa algorithms, to take a totally unrelated example, this isn't fully automated, right? The human is in the loop. No, no, no. The, the question is the relation uh, between a recommendation system and the humans deploying it and, and how important, like how the human kind of learns from it, how they use it, and quite frankly, how consequential it is, uh, you know, as according to a kind of decision that is potentially going to make a, a very significant impact on people's careers and futures. Um, so, sure, fine, let's not automate it fully, but actually most of the systems that we're talking about aren't that. I mean, as, as everybody has observed in the comments, and we are well aware, uh, the system that we were legally challenging is not an AI, right? It's one step up from a spreadsheet. Uh, but that's not the point. The point is the, the consequential nature of the decision being made and whether what you've designed is, is acceptable to people and whether the people deploying the system understand it or, or, or mitigating the bias. Thanks, Corey. Um, Janice, I think you wanted to make a comment. Yeah, I wanted to follow up on, on what uh, Corey has said and some others have said as well. I mean, I think that making high stakes decisions based on one test is, is problematic. And sometimes students are maybe garner up enough motivation and do really well and that represents their best performance. But I think with systems that track students across long periods for perhaps years, uh, such as our system does, um, we can say, was this a valid assessment of Johnny or did Johnny just have a bad day? Because if you're using it to make a decision as to whether Johnny's going to go to Stanford or Johnny's going to go to a university of, I don't know where, 
you better be sure it represents what Johnny can really do. So I think that's very important. High stakes um, systems are um, particularly pro problematic in that regard and, you know, testing the frenzy around testing and the parents paying for private tutoring. I'm one of those parents. I did pay for private tutoring. And so I know how much it can increase students' scores. But when you have performance-based systems, you can get really at how well students are, are doing at these competencies that we deem are important. I think it was Priya who said that, you know, uh, people will teach to the test more or less, right? So if you have an assessment that's going to focus on this, then that's what teachers will focus on and that's what people will prioritize. But if you have a system that's tracking what students should do along the lines of say skills that we deem important for the 21st century, which is what Simon talked about, um, then and you calibrate that system um, properly and with care and ethics, you can get at how they're going about these competencies in very fine grained ways. And a teacher can literally walk over to a student and say, wow, Billy, I saw how well you formed a hypothesis, a hypothesis, collected data, interpreted data, warranted your claims, but I see how you're struggling to write uh, a claim and evidence and reasoning statement in words, because this student might be one of these math science geniuses who can't articulate what they know in words. Well, what's problematic in our education system really worldwide is that we've used what people write or what they say as a ground truth about what they know. And in fact, many people are not very good at writing. Many people know many more things than they can write about. So our system has shown that between 30 to 60% of kids are misassessed when you rely on what they write. And it's problematic in both ways. So you also have these false positives. A student who's just kind of parroting what they've read or heard and is, is getting like, oh yeah, they're, they're getting by. At a certain point, that student is gonna get pushed along and then all of a sudden we're gonna realize they actually don't have the competencies we think they do. Right. So what our system is being used for is to identify these varying kind of competencies and then the teacher can help the student. Uh, Rex, our digital agent, can help the student. And it's really uh, taken a lot of frustration out of the you know, lives of teachers, parents and kids because, you know, kids like Billy, for example, I like to use that name. It's really good at conducting science inquiry, but can't write about it. So he's like, why do I keep getting C's and B's when I know I know all this stuff, right? And conversely, Johnny, who, you know, these are just boys by coincidence, Johnny, who's just parroted, the teacher can walk over and say, hey, you've written some really interesting things and your claim evidence reasoning statements are actually scientifically accurate. Let's go back and pair that with this rich experiment so we can tie that experience to that knowledge, right? So you, I don't want teachers to use my technology as a, hey, I got you, you must have been cheating off somebody, right? I want them to go over and say, let's now pair that with something really rich and deep that can drive your learning. And, you know, this is being, um, being used in lots of different schools in special education settings as well, where teachers are getting really fine grained data at how kids who have typically very long trajectories of skill development are showing real advancement. And so we're really excited by by these data and really um, hope that systems in the future are more oriented around these kinds of performance assessments in the domains in which they um, exist and are targeted for. Thanks for that, uh, Janice. Right, um, I've got uh, one question. It may be our final one. Um, if, it, if the answers are brief, then we may get to one more, but this may be the uh, last question before I ask uh, my co-chair Tim Clement Jones just to uh, do a brief uh, summary. Um, yeah, so my question was around kind of whether we should be using AI in, uh, I guess, education as a standpoint, um, given the fact that AI is basically predicated on finding similarities and trends using limited data to then make inferences and then classifications. Do we think that in an, in an area such as education, whereby it actually can have a huge I guess, impact on someone's future that we should be using it as a standpoint? Or are we actually talking about actually potentially using tools such as just automation and computation, which can just speed up processes in, instead? Thanks, Marcel. Who would like to uh, make a comment on that? Uh, yes, Lawrence. Ah, yes. Can I take that? And Marcel, you're exactly right. I mean, the fundamental technology of AI is all about spotting patterns. 
Um, but uh, so the the my answer, first of all, to you would be yes. I think AI should belong in this because there are countless examples that we can cite where AI has been better at spotting patterns than people. Uh, for example, uh, there's research that we did into something called diabetic retinopathy, where um, an AI that was trained by diabetic retinopathy experts using plenty of data ended up outperforming even some of the best um, ophthalmologists globally. So if it's designed properly and it has the correct data and it has the correct expertise, it can be massively beneficial. That's a lot of ifs and coulds and buts. And um, so understand that. But I think, you know, we shouldn't let the, um, the, the fear that's from me from the hype cycle stop us like digging deeper into those kind of things if there is a beneficial outcome. Lawrence, uh, thank you very much indeed. Ah, Priya, you'd like to... Thank you. I just wanted to add that the best AI system, I agree that yes, it should does exist. It should exist, right? I mean, it is existing already. There are many schools, there are many higher educational institutions that use AI for learning and assessment, but it's augmentative. I think some of the, we're in the confines of high stakes assessment with a lot of this discussion today. And we're thinking about how AI might be used in assessment. This is about what do we want? So it's about bringing learning into the process. It's not just about assessment. And actually I loved Peter's point. I think Peter's point, his question opens up really the fundamental discussion, which is actually with big data, when you can track so much more, can you give more of a holistic picture? Lord Young, 10 years ago, you know, was trying to get us to think about a digital passport for students. So Victoria's not just stuck with a, a few grades. You know, the idea is, can we give more of a holistic picture? And actually, there is no better system than to be able to do that than something that collects big data. And then because it's augmentative, you can add that qualitative side of things. You know, you can add the teacher feedback. The fact that teachers aren't trusted in this country is the biggest injustice to that entire sector. And that needs to be changed. Teachers need to feel trusted that their feedback, that their evaluation is also important. And then if somebody comes along and says, teacher didn't know me very well, well, then a system can use the quantitative data and then question that and say, well, based on all past performance, that ought to be questioned. So I think, you know, and obviously people will say, look, I'm biased towards this. I run Century. It is about AI and education, but it's about what is education. Education is not about assessment. It's about, you know, opportunity and choice for all people. And so how can we now use technology to try to help augment that and enhance it? Thank you very much. Um, I'm now going to uh, pass over to my co-chair, Lord Timon Clement Jones, who will just do a sort of a, a 30 second wrap up as we run out of time. But uh, it's got Tim. short. It's got shorter and shorter. It was going to be 60 seconds, Stephen. Um, but uh, you're so uh, um, right. I mean, this is uh, uh, quite difficult to wrap up. But I, uh, what I found, and it's been a fantastic uh, session, um, our panel really have restored my faith uh, in the potential. Because I do think that um, what we really mustn't do is use this summer's experience as any kind of uh, real test as to whether or not uh, this is viable uh, for the future. Um, uh, uh, I, I mean, rightly, uh, Corey and colleagues took um, uh, legal action against this kind of ridiculous um, way of trying to assess uh, uh, young people's achievements. Um, but I think we've heard today, and why don't we have the people that we've had on the panel today actually write the guidelines for the future use of um, of uh, AI in education, because certainly um, they're the experts and they seem to um, be quite confident that there are uh, ways of using AI which augments uh, uh, how uh, teachers operate. It's not substitutional. Um, it allows them, it frees them up um, to do what they want to do, what they came in to the teaching profession to do. Um, uh, the idea isn't to uh, uh, suddenly get the machines uh, taking over. Um, so to that extent, I think, um, you know, we've heard some really uh, interesting and um, perhaps we're um, at the right point in the Gartner cycle as part of, uh, as far as Lawrence is, is concerned, but we do need more practitioners, more people who really understand what this is all about, because until we do, until this is, voodoo as part uh, as far as most teachers are concerned uh, then we're not going to get very far thank you very much uh, indeed uh, tim and uh, on that point i'm going to draw this to a close i just want to uh, say thank you to uh, 
our panelists, to Simon, to Victoria, Corey, Priya, Lawrence and Janice for their contributions this evening, for making this such an uh, entertaining and informative discussion uh, and the start, I uh, hope, of uh, some work or indeed more work on our part to work out some of the uh, the answers to some of the challenges that have been thrown down. Thrown down. And I'd also like to thank all of you for attending and joining us. Uh, this, I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. And of course, I'd also like to thank uh, Begita at the Big Innovation Centre and Zire, who helps pull all this together for us. Uh, without whose help, it just wouldn't happen. Thank you all very much for your attendance. Good night. Cheerio. Thanks, folks. Bye, Thank everybody.